As each moment explodes into reality from the cosmos, a path forms, showing where we are in this journey that we call life. Some of us become famous whether we had wanted to or not, and some of us just sit quietly riding along life's journey, accepting whatever destination it brings us to. The question we ask is this, are those that reach the pinnacle of fame really in control of where that path led? Or were they already destined to take that path that had already been laid out for them? I'm your host, Edward A. Doyle, and these are the continuing tales of fame and fate of people's journeys through life from birth to death. And we'll let you decide if their fame was already written by fate. You know, as children, we have all kinds of grandiose ideas of what career that we want to have when we grow up. I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> and my best friend, Brian, well, he wanted to be a paramedic. You know, some of the common things that we hear from little ones when we ask them that question is that they want to be a baseball player or a basketball player. Some want to be actors and some just want to be cowboys. Now imagine, if you will, one little boy actually accomplishing all of his dreams, such as becoming a professional basketball player and a professional baseball player. <laughs> Even a famous actor in over 207 film and TV roles and becoming a real life cowboy. Fantasy, you say? Oh, no, 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 not at all. You see, there was one little boy that actually became all that he dreamt of becoming. His name was Kevin Joseph Aloysius Connors, known to you and me as Chuck Connors. It was a Sunday, April 10th, 1921, in Brooklyn, New York, when Marcella and Alvin Francis Connors welcomed into the world their firstborn son, Kevin Joseph Aloysius Connors. Both of his parents were originally from the Dominion of Newfoundland, now part of Canada, and were both Roman Catholics from Irish descent. As a young boy, Kevin, as he was known before he had his nickname of Chuck, attended the Our Lady of Perpetual Help Basilica School in Brooklyn. There, he also served the church as an altar boy. Kevin later joined the Bay Ridge Boys Club and played Sandlot baseball with the club's team, the Bay Ridge Celtics. These early years were the start of him showing off his athletic abilities. And while attending high school at Manual Training High School, which would later be renamed in 1960 to the John Jay High School, young Kevin would win a scholarship to Adelphi Academy at Adelphi, Kevin played baseball, basketball, football, and even ran track. With his hard work and amazing athletic ability, Kevin was offered several scholarships and chose to attend Seton Hall University. It was during this time that Kevin's new nickname of Chuck would become his moniker for the remainder of his life. Now, there's conflicting stories on just where this nickname came from. His sister Gloria had told interviewers years later that it was given to him by his baseball teammates because Kevin would always be yelling, chuck it to me, chuck the ball to me, come on, chuck it. But in an interview in Connor's later years, he himself told the reporter that he had given himself the nickname. Why? Because he had just always plain old liked the name Chuck. Chuck spent two years in Seton Hall, excelling in basketball and baseball. But when America's involvement in World War II began, Connors would leave Seton Hall and join the Army on October 20th, 1942. He began his training in the infantry at Fort Knox, Kentucky, where, by the way, is where I also attended basic training. Hmm, I wonder what his opinion would have been of the three most dreaded hills for a raw recruit misery, 
agony, <laughs> and heartbreak. Well, anyways, after his basic training, Chuck would become a tank warfare instructor at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and he would later serve as the same at West Point. He was honorably discharged from the Army in 1946. After his discharge, he decided he would return to what he loved most, sports. He tried out for and was recruited by the Boston Celtics basketball team as number 11 for the 1946 and 1947 seasons. He was ranked 19th on the team playing center for a total of 53 games. But in the spring of 1947, being a lifelong Dodgers fan, he decided he wanted to try out for spring training with the Brooklyn Dodgers and he made it onto the Dodgers farm team. Connors would spend the next few years bouncing around from farm team to farm team in Rochester, Newark, Norfolk, and Montreal. It was in Montreal that Chuck would find his sweetheart, Elizabeth Riddell. They married in October of 1948. A year later, Chuck Connors would reach his sports dream and was moved up to the show to play for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Alas, as a first baseman for the Dodgers with only one at bat, Five weeks later, he would be sent back down to Montreal. The couple would have four sons over the next 13 years. As a family man, Chuck worked hard and he'd continued to chase his baseball dream. And finally, he got to play in the big leagues for the Chicago Cubs in 1951. Connors hit two home runs during that season, but unfortunately would once again be sent back down to the Cubs farm team the LA Angels. Now at this time of his life Chuck Connors may not have had much fame but one might wonder if his not so spectacular performance as a baseball player could actually be due to fate. I mean look at what was yet to come for this young man of many dreams and talents. You know while playing for the LA Angels a baseball fan who happened to also be a casting director for MGM, noticed the six foot six inch muscular Connors on the field. And after speaking with Connors, the casting director actually recommended Connors for a role in the 1952 comedy film Pat and Mike, starring Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. Now let me tell you, being an actor myself, <laughs> knowing how hard it is to even get an audition for a film with much lesser known actors and actually getting cast in that film? Well, I'll tell you, it must have seemed like he won the lottery. An unknown, untrained rookie actor appearing in a film with the likes of Tracy and Hepburn. I can't even begin to imagine Originally, Connors was cast for the role of the prize fighter, but he would appear in the film as the captain of the state police after the original role that he auditioned for was given to actor Aldo Wright. In an interview years later, Connors told reporter Dick Dubrow, hey, let's not kid each other. I got into the acting business because I was a ball player, not an actor. I had pals in the movie business and they gave me a break. When Connors began his acting career, he saw himself as the ultimate cowboy. But several years and many roles later, Connors still had not gotten into a Western. Let's face it, a Brooklyn-born kid that grew up in the city was not going to be the first choice for directors to cast as a cowboy. Connors had said, I had a Brooklyn accent, didn't know how to ride a horse, and I wore a crew cut that hardly looked Western. But Connors was determined to be a cowboy. He worked at it every way he could. He started by buying an old horse with a game leg, as he put it, and rented an acre of land where he put up a fence and built a stable. He cared for the horse and fed it, watered it, and worked as hard on the horse as he worked on himself. Watching all kinds of other cowboy films, Connors worked very hard to lose his accent and to talk like a cowboy and decided to let his hair grow. He practiced and practiced day in, day out. 
He may have gotten a lucky break to begin with, but he had to prove himself to become what he wanted to be in the movies. Khan has appeared in 20 more films in various roles in films such as Trouble Along the Way with John Wayne and Donna Reed, Dragonfly Squadron with John Hodiak and Barbara Britton, Good Morning Miss Dove with Jennifer Jones and Robert Stack, and others before he got his first Western film break in 1958, getting the role of Buck Hennessy in MGM's The Big Country, starring Gregory Peck. In 1958, in what would solidify Connor's career and forever be remembered for, Chuck was approached with an offer for the role of Lucas McCain in a new TV series called The Rifleman. He turned down the role. Connors had said that the salary was way too low. So the producers then went out and considered James Whitmore and John Anderson for the role. But after watching the magic chemistry that Connors had with Tommy Kirk and Old Yeller, they approached him again, this time with a salary he would accept. The Rifleman starring Chuck Connors had a very successful run on ABC for five years in 168 episodes. This was also the first time in television history that a primetime series would feature a single parent raising a child. Set in the 1880s in a fictitious town called North Fork, New Mexico, produced by Four Star Television, the show would follow the lives of a Civil War veteran, Lucas McCain, and his son, Mark. The show also featured the regular Paul Fix, playing the role of Marshal Micah Torrance, and there were many, many others appearing in both multiple and single episodes. It was during the final two years of the series in 1962 that Chuck and his wife Elizabeth would decide to divorce for reasons not publicized by them or the media. Chuck Connors became a household name as he, Lucas McCain, and his son Mark, played by Johnny Crawford, entered into the living rooms and the hearts of America each week, telling stories of what it was like in the early Western days and capturing the dreams and the hearts of children and adults alike. In 1963, the series ended. There were a few theories on why after five successful years on television. One was that the producers decided to end it for most reasons because the last two years ratings began to drop and the producers wanted to stay on top of the earnings and not take the chance of losing money. The second theory was that it has been called the Johnny Crawford effect. See, he was the perfect actor for the role of Mark McCain. But as the show went on, he grew up and was outgrowing the role. There was no way with the fame that Crawford was growing that he could be replaced. And the third theory was that at that time, the Western genre was getting saturated and the producers just did not want the show to get lost in a sea of other Westerns. After divorcing his first wife in 1962, Connors fell for another actress while working on the set of the film Geronimo, where Connors actually starred in the film as the Apache Chief Geronimo. It was there that he and Kamala Devi fell in love and would marry the following year. They would spend 10 years together. Connor's career was a magnificent one. He would appear in movies such as Pat and Mike, The Big Country, Flipper, Support Your Local Gunfighter, Soylent Green, Airplane 2 the sequel, Taxi Killer, and so many more in between. He appeared in TV shows such as The Adventures of Superman, Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, Branded, which he also starred in, The Six Million Dollar Man, The Love Boat, and many, many, many more with his last appearance in Kenny Rogers' The Gambler Returns. Chuck Connors had a spectacular career and most actors would only dream of having. In his career as an actor, he was in over 207 film and TV roles, from westerns to war movies, from dramas to comedies, 
and even in 1979 in a horror movie called Tourist Trap. Connors won the Western Heritage Award in 1991 and is in the Hall of Great Western Performers. He also won the Golden Boot Award in 1984 and he got his star on the Walk of Fame also in 1984. In 1973, Chuck and Kamala would divorce just like his first marriage. He would meet his third bride, be on the film set of the film Soylent Green, where he found Faith Quibius. After with only two years, they too would also divorce. Chuck was a very heavy smoker, and on the 10th day of November 1992, Chuck Connors died of lung cancer and pneumonia. If you want to pay your respects to Chuck, you can do so by visiting his final resting place in the San Fernando Mission Cemetery in Los Angeles, California in Section J, T20, grave number 123. You'll find it easily with his tombstone carrying a photo as Lucas McCain in The Rifleman. I want to thank you for watching episode one of season two here on Tales of Fame and Fate. Please subscribe to us today and hit that bell icon. That way you'll get notified as soon as there's a new episode. Now don't forget, this season every episode has a free giveaway. That's right, and we have one here for Chuck Connors. We're going to be giving away the complete first season, volume one and volume two. That's 40 episodes of The Rifleman absolutely free. All you need to do is subscribe, put a comment in this video with your name saying I want to win the DVDs and at the end of the month we will be drawing the winner live. Our next episode is going to feature Pat Morita from The Karate Kid and you've got to remember him from Happy Days as Arnold. So again, thank you so much for being with us. Tell your friends, tell your family. You can find me on Facebook and on Instagram in I am Edward A. Doyle. Thanks so much. Have a great night.